Hello and welcome to our South Fork Sea Farmers Program, Peconic Bay Scallops, The Outlook. Thank you to our sponsors today, Channing Daughters Winery and Promised Land Mariculture Company. I'm here today with Stephen Tuttleback, shellfish expert at Cornell Cooperative Marine Extension, who's also known as the Bay Scallop Guru, as well as Barley Dunn, director of East Hampton Shellfish Hatchery and operator and owner of Shellworks. I am Alexandra Talti, an environmental journalist from Southampton, New York, focusing on water and climate change. Scallops, as we all know, are a quintessential East End delicacy known around the world. In the 1980s, Peconic Bay was the largest bay scallop fishery in the world. Since then, landings of all bivalves, including scallops, have decreased 99%. Um, and we're really lucky to have such an expert from a science perspective on this. Stephen, if you could share for those at home who are maybe more familiar with scallops in butter than in the bay, um, what is the life cycle of the bay scallop and why is it so fragile compared to other bivalves? Yeah, the bay scallop, so if you know what, uh, if you've been to Shell uh, to get gas, Shell gasoline, that's what a scallop shell looks like. Um, what we eat is the adductor muscle. It's a single large muscle in the shell. Um, so bay scallops are bivalve mollusks. That is, they have two shells. Uh, they live uh, less than two years. And it's a very interesting life cycle. They um, typically spawn themselves after a year. Uh, the larval period, um, once the eggs and sperm are shed into the water column, um, the larval uh, development takes about two weeks. Uh, one of the interesting things about bay scallops is that they are functional hermaphrodites. That is, they produce both eggs and sperm in the same individual. And um, they're actually capable of self-fertilization, which we believe is helpful in periods when the scallop densities are very low. Um, so once the, the larvae um, drift around in, in the tidal currents for about two weeks, they settle to the bottom. Uh, they typically like to attach to objects above the bottom. Uh, the most revered of their habitats is eelgrass. And uh, over the years, we've seen a dramatic decline in eelgrass along the uh, US Atlantic coast. So now uh, they're actually left to uh, rely on other substrates, which we can get into later if there's time. But um, so the scalps will remain attached above the bottom for uh, a few days to actually a couple of months, depending upon what the substrate is. Then they settle to the bottom. Um, they, they do swim around, uh, which is uh, one thing that most bivalves uh, do not do, like clams and oysters. Um, and then they grow very rapidly. When they reach an age of about a year, they themselves spawn. So one of the interesting things about bay scallops is that they will then go on to live for about six to nine months more, start to gear up to reproduce a second time, but most of them will actually die naturally before they reach age two. So it works out really well for the fishery because the, the fishery can basically take these adults without too much harm of, of um, damaging the, the future populations. But um, it does lead to population cycles that are boom and bust. So every year is dependent upon the offspring for that given year. And you don't have a buffer like you would in a clam or an oyster population that lived considerably longer. Um, so scallops actually are known um, widely as the canaries in the coal mine. They're very sensitive to environmental factors more so than other shellfish. And that's one of the reasons why we're encountering more problems with them compared to other species. And Barley, I know that um, you've been in this area for a long time working on the water and you know, working with East Hampton Shellfish Hatchery. Can you just talk a little bit about you know, some of the environmental degradation that you've seen and the loss of the eel grasses, which are so important to the scallop? Yeah, I've worked in, in East Hampton for the East Hampton Shellfish Hatchery for just short of 20 years now. And even just during that period, um, places like, you know, Lake Montauk, right off where Rick's Crabby Cowboy Cafe used to be or Gone Fishing Marina, it used to be a huge eelgrass bed. And we used to seed scallops there every year. Um, Hog Creek, also the same, Hans Creek, those, these areas in East Hampton used to be covered, you know, and obviously before that, 
every, everywhere in the Peconics, all the Peconics and all the inner harbors were covered in eelgrass and all that, really all that is gone. You don't see any eelgrass anymore. Sometimes you'll see some washed up on the shore after a, after a storm, but really there's no substantial eelgrass beds left. Um, and I think one of the things Steve was allu alluding to is there's, there's fallbacks, there's other potential habitat that scallops can survive in, but I think eelgrass is really the, the premier habitat for them because it really grows from the bottom all the way to the surface, and these tiny scallops, when they set, will attach to those blades and get up off the bottom away from predators. But other things like codium, which is, has, got, has lots of nicknames, Sputnik grass, uh, I think Frank calls them dead man's fingers. <laughs> um, they look like s kind of fat noodles, and, they're, and you often see them washed up. Uh, they'll often attach to shell, and, you'll, and they, they're kind of semi-buoyant, so they'll actually wash up, and you'll see them on shore. And there's also a, a widgeon grass that's been showing up lately that could be an alternative, but eelgrass is really the best habitat for them. And Stephen, earlier you mentioned that it's the scallop can be the canary in the coal mine, and I know living out here, you know, you'll hear, oh, this is good scallop season, or this is a bad scallop season, and it always is kind of this barometer of, at least for me, like how things are going. What is the role of the bay scallop in the marine environment, and why? What do you mean when you say canary? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> basically, everything will eat bay scallops at one point or time in its life cycle. So. You know, jellyfish will eat them uh, when they're in the larval cycle, um, perhaps uh, larval fish. Uh, when they settle to the bottom, um, basically any, any crab that's out there will eat scallops uh, if they're appropriate size. Oyster drills, uh, whelks will eat them. Uh, fish are probably a very important predator. Um, so, you know, their role in the ecosystem is, you know, they're an important food source for other organisms. Um, and of course, they're important uh, to us as, as food, um, as a delicacy. Um, what I mean by saying they're a canary in a coal mine is that they are more susceptible to environmental factors than a lot of other organisms are. So um, basically, if you start to see scallops being affected, that means that uh, something's wrong with the environment. And, and you may see it in the, in the scallops before you would see it in a clam or an oyster or some other organism. So, um, you know, they, they're, they're really kind of an indicator species in that regard. Um, and, um, and we'll get into the, the die-off of, of scallops that's uh, occurred over the last three years. But, you know, this, this is a sign that, that things are uh, seriously wrong um, in a lot of ways in our waters. And so I know we were talking a little bit about like alternatives to eelgrass from a farming perspective because you know oyster farms are popping up all over on the east end and it's kind of seen as this mitigation for climate change as well as way to clean our water. Um, are there prospects for scallop farming and how does what does that look like barley? I think there are prospects but it's a, it's a whole lot more labor intensive. Uh, the seed is relatively more difficult to come by because ha it's, it's just a, diff it's a harder animal to grow mm. at the larval and, and post-set seed stages. Um, there's, you know, so really there's two topics. One is if we farm them, do we grow them to the two-year-old, you know, the near two-year-old size so they have that huge meat that we could sell? Or do we grow them for what we call the in-shell market, which is basically grow figure grow a scallop for one, one season from, say, June to November, and you have a, a kind of a silver dollar-sized scallop that could be sold and eaten in shell. So the one thing about aquaculturing most of these species is there's an aquaculture exemption, which means that basically if somebody is farming these animals, they can sell them at any size. So if you were to go out and wild harvest oysters, your size limit is three inches. But if you're farming them, you really have no size limit. So if you have a clientele that prefers a two or two and a half inch oyster, you can sell that. Same goes for base scallops. There's an aquaculture exemption for base scallops, so we can sell really any size scallop. So the question really is, is there a, a market for in-shell scallops, which would really mean that people are eating the entire animal, like we do think clams and spaghetti, maybe you'd have scallops and spaghetti instead. So, but if we're growing 
scallops for, like I said before, the, that big meat that we're used to getting in the fall, then you're talking about buying seed, getting scallop seed in June, growing that through the season, overwintering it, and then growing it through the next season, which is, ex I don't know, personally, I don't know of anybody that's doing it. It's possible, but very labor intensive. You're gonna suffer some mortalities. Uh, but it might be, you know, it might be what we're up against. If there's no wild harvest, that might be what we have to do. Yeah, it, as far as I know, there's only been one person in the United States that was able to grow base scops, overwinter them, and then bring them to market as a large scop, as Barley was saying. And uh, it was a grower up on uh, Cape Cod. And, um, y you know, w when I was in school many years ago, um, I was like, you know, scalps, the, the price even back then was high, and I was like, why aren't people growing scalps? And, you know, uh, my professor said, well, the economics just don't work out to grow them to market size. And I was like, really? So, you know, after all this time, the, the, this only one individual was able to do it. And, and in order for him to be successful, he actually created a niche market. So he produced scalps of these wild colors, oranges and pinks and purples, and was able to sell that as a, in a niche market. And that was the only way he was able to succeed. But mm -hmm. as far as I know, no one else has gotten them to grow over the winter and sell them as adults and, and actually do it successfully commercially. And when you say that it's like a lot of um, work of the overwintering, you mean like it's a labor intensive process yeah. specifically for like, cause I know with oysters, it's not that difficult. I have a hobby oyster farm and yeah. you know, we clean them, we throw them in there and like they're fine. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just holding, um, you know, as Barley uh, started to say, um, just holding them in, in nets over the winter, usually you see very high mortality. They, they don't like to be close together as, as like oysters. Oysters don't really care, you know, but scallops, they, they typically will bite onto one another, you know, and then, and then they, they die from that. And so typically we would see like 50% mortality over the winter. And you know, if you're trying to make money at this, uh, it's it's very difficult. And when you're working with oysters, like with your oysters, you can you can you can really be rough with them. You can take them out of the cage, dump them into a tote, walk away, have a cup of coffee while they're sitting there dry as a bone, and no problem. With scallops, you cannot, you can't get away with that. They have to be in water. I mean, they can be out of the water for you know a matter of minutes, but not a matter of hours like oysters can. This time of year, working with oysters, you can tote them and leave them out overnight, come back the next day and continue working with them. You can't do that with scallops at all. And like Steve mentioned, you can't, they can't be packed in the density that oysters can. So for instance, at the, at the shellfish hatchery, you know, we grow oysters, clams, and scallops, and we can, we can really only grow about 10% of the number of scallops that we can oysters, pretty much purely because of that density, the fact that they really need to be in water. When we're working with them, we keep them in flowing water. Whereas, like I said, oysters, you can work with them dry and take them out, work with them, restock them. And at the hatchery, are you guys, um, can you talk about the East Hampton Shellfish Gardening Program and if you guys have plans to add scallops there? Yeah. So like, like your program, the SPAT program, we have an oyster, uh, oyster gardening program. Um, and basically what this allows is individuals from the community can grow up to a thousand shellfish at a time. That's the New York state law. Um, and I say shellfish because hopefully, you know, we can expand to something like scallops. So right now, uh, individuals can grow oysters and oysters are really the best candidate because of what we've been saying. They're, they're tough, they grow fast. You can go from seed to something you can shuck and put on your table in a year and a half. Um, so the prospect of scallops, that, so the next possible candidate might be scallops, but you know, it would have to be, you know, I think maybe we would uh, allow people that have been doing it for a few years and have a good hand on how, what, what's involved to grow scallops, but there'd be some additional training. Um, again, it's, and it's gonna cut into your 1,000 shellfish cap. So you know, scallops are a possibility, but again, they're gonna be completely different. A lot, in a lot of ways, you can grow them in the same bag that you grow your oyster in. But like I said, you just can't can't bring them up to up to land high and dry. So hopefully we'll we'll get some scallops into the program. But it's just a, it's just that added uh, education, labor, and effort that'll be involved. 
Sounds exciting, though. I feel like this, it's always cool when there's like a new industry, I feel like that's happening that could be positive. Um, but obviously, we're in this situation because of like environmental degradation. Um, Stephen, can you talk a little bit about the brown tide in the 1980s and then the effect and how, you know, that's kind of the initial place where all of these issues that we're seeing now have started? Sure. Yeah, as Marley mentioned, uh, the, the New York Bay Scalp fishery at one time was the leading uh, fishery in the United States and the world. Um, and then, um, you know, so the average harvest before the first brown tide uh, was about 300,000 pounds of meats, all right? So just, wow. just the adductor muscle, 300,000 pounds. So the first brown tide uh, occurred in 1985. No one had ever seen this type of, of uh, alga before. It's a single-celled alga that um, basically decimated uh, base scalp stocks as well as uh, damaged other uh, um, shellfish uh, stocks as well. But uh, the scalps were especially hard hit. And um, what happened was, it turned out that this uh, brown tide actually caused scalps to starve to death. Um, so in, in other words, if the concentrations were high enough, the scalps would stop feeding. And so there was a big die-off in 1985, um, and then the brown tide occurred again in 1986 and 1987. So three years in a row, and when you have an animal that essentially lives to spawn just once, and you get three years in a row, you, you get to a point where they're almost extinct. And that's exactly what happened. Um, you know, we went from 300,000 pounds to, I think it was uh, 300 pounds uh, were harvested in 1987, 1988. Um, so I got involved with uh, scalp restoration in 1987. Um, a couple of Bayman, uh, Pete Wenzel and Steve Latson were the ones who started this. And then uh, uh, Chris Smith from Cornell Crawford Extension um, started to help lead that and so I got involved uh, back in the 80s and we did see a bump up in the scalp harvests uh, but we had more brown tides occur and then uh, the worst brown tide uh, happened in 1995 and essentially all the gains that had been made from restoration got leveled out to near zero so for 12 years uh, we went and the scalp populations did not recover on their own and then um, we were fortunate to get funding from uh, Suffolk County and uh, started a second restoration program in uh, 2005 and continue to this day. But, um, you know, we had really good success with that. We, the scalp harvests uh, increased uh, over 30 times the landings of what they were uh, prior to, to um, 2005. So the restoration really worked, and, and I know that uh, Barley and his team also have been doing uh, restoration work, and, and that's also been successful as well. So it has worked, but what happened was um, in 2019, we saw a mass die-off of adult scalps, and we saw that happen again uh, in 2020, and then we've seen it again this year. So three years in a row now, we've seen a mass die-off of adult scalps. So, we're at a point now where the, the fishery is, you know, it's less than 1% of what it was um, just, you know, a few years ago. Um, so, yeah, it's been devastating. Very startling. And I know, so obviously you're talking about like restoration of the habitat. How does climate change and warming water kind of factor into this? Yeah, so, um, you know, as Barley talked about, uh, eelgrass is, is almost gone in the Peconic Bays. And, you know, that, that really is the best habitat for scallops. So going into the big restoration work, we, we didn't know if it was going to be successful, certainly. Um, but despite the lack of eelgrass, we did see this, this improvement, this, this drastic um, increase in the scallop populations and the fishery. So, um, so that, that certainly um, has been, you know, a factor that's important and perhaps the restoration would have been more successful if we had eelgrass, but, you know, at this point we, we can't know that, you know. So we've been studying uh, potential causes of this die-off for the last three years, and what we think is going on is, it, the bottom line is we, we firmly believe that it's driven by the climate crisis. Um, so a combination of factors, uh, higher water temperatures, and when I talk higher water temperatures, we're, we're talking about temperatures uh, in, in some of the embayments uh, 
over 80 degrees. And, and not just for a day or two, like for sustained periods of, of time. And this is really right at the red line of what um, our base scallops can tolerate. So in addition to the high water temperature, uh, there's also a disease that's present in our scallops. And um, one of our, the colleagues that we've worked with, Dr. Basamalam at Stony Brook, discovered this parasite in 2019, and it's in 100% of our scallops. So we believe those two factors in combination um, with spawning of, of scalps, because we're seeing this mortality in adult scalps, but not in the juveniles. So that, that's why we believe that spawning is important. So it's like a perfect storm of these different factors, and that's what we believe is, is driving the mortality of, of these adult scalps. So when I'm talking about like, you know, from 2018 to 2019, there was a 95% die-off of the scalps. And in 2020, it was ni over 99% of what the stocks were in, in, two, in just two years before, you know. So, so there's a lot of interesting questions. You know, how long has this parasite been present in our scalps? And it may have been there all along, but no one had ever looked at it, you know. Um, we got samples from uh, Nantucket where there haven't been these mass die-offs. Uh, we got them two years ago. 100% of the scalps had them there, all right? But it's cooler up there. And so, you know, that parasite may not do anything unless the water temperature is high enough to, to cause this additional physiological stress. There's suggestions from the scientific literature that uh, there were scalp mortalities in the, in the 80s that may have potentially been linked to this parasite, but we just don't know. We just don't know. But right now we're at this, this very, um, you know, um, dire set of circumstances where the, the scalps are in a situation where, you know, they, they just may not be able to tolerate these environmental factors. Very sad. Um, and I'm sure a story we're going to hear more of as everything continues to change around us. Um, Barley, can you share, you know, as someone who uh, works on the water and has your own business, how does the bay scallop, or how has the bay scallop kind of figured into commercial fishing and the baymen culture of the East End? Yeah, I think a lot of a lot of folks used to rely on that end of the year, you know, I wouldn't call it a bonus, but it was an end of the year sustained income that they would rely on and uh, probably made or, bro made or broke a lot of Christmases. <laughs> and the last few have broken Christmases, so um, I know a few, of the, a few of the guys are actually, they've gone to gill netting or setting up pound traps instead of relying on shellfish. I can think of two off the top of my head that are, get, that are getting into the uh, dragger commercial fishing business and, you know, basically going offshore instead of staying, staying inshore. Um, the la last year was the first year that some of, some of my friends that would, you know, that go out on opening day no matter what, and they didn't even bother. You know, that's, that is huge. Yeah. For these folks that have been going out scalloping on opening day their entire life to just not even bother, it's, it's, it's bad. Yeah, growing up out here, it's funny, like, I've, I've found so many people that, like, make money off the water, and now I'm realizing that, like, my childhood wouldn't, at this time, be replicated because there's not that many people anymore that oh. can do that. Um, have you, can you talk a little bit about that shift from being, like, a traditional bayman or bay woman to now having to be offshore, and, like, what does that mean? Well, I, I think they're just going to have to relearn the, the trade. You know, it's an entirely different animal, if you will. You know, they're, uh, instead of going out with, with, with small skiff and a rake or a look box, they're, you know, setting nets and going farther offshore in the rougher waters. Um, it's just, and it's a whole lot more of an investment. You know, you're talking about six-digit boats that require a lot of equipment and maintenance. Um, it's just a totally, and a totally different lifestyle, you know, not, not, not necessarily being home for dinner every night, but offshore for a few days at a time. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, when the brown tide hit um, in the 80s, um, a lot of fishermen left the water. You know, uh, I think the estimate at that time was that there were 400 to 600 full-time baymen, and um, many of them left the water and, and never went back. And, 
you know, um, I remember hearing that at, at that time the base scalp fishery uh, for, for many of the guys uh, amounted to about 70 percent of their annual income. So, you know, um, obviously, you know, we, we haven't had that level of harvest, although, you know, with the success of, of the restoration work, uh, the scalp populations did come back. And, you know, the, the value of that fishery was a million, million and a half dollars a year. So that, that, that was a substantial importance to them. Um, but one of the things that's happening now is that, um, you know, the, while the scalps have declined, they're, they're not the only fishery that's declined. Um, one of the other big fisheries that many of the inshore baymen rely on is the channel whelk or conch. And, and that fishery has crashed. Um, you know, um, the, there's been a, a push by many of the baymen uh, for uh, minimum size uh, regulations. And, and yet New York has not instituted any, any uh, management measures um, to help protect the whelk fishery. So it, it's kind of a controversial subject, but the reality is that that was one of the most important fisheries in recent years, and, and now it's, it's very hard for the, the baymen to make, um, you know, in, any reasonable amount of money on that. So, so y you have a decline of, of several fisheries at once, so wh what, what is left to be able to harvest, you know? So guys, you know, are, they're, they're working on, you know, uh, black sea bass or, or you know, porgies a little bit or something, you know, but for, for guys to make a transition from working inshore to buying a dragger and go fish in the ocean, it's, it's like starting a whole new career almost, yeah. you know. So it, it's a very uh, big leap uh, to have to do that. Uh, but that's how desperate it has gotten for, for many of the fishermen now. Um, and to maybe make things a little bit more positive, why are sea scallops not declining? Um, so sea scallops are uh, the larger scallops. Uh, if, if you've eaten those, the abductor mussels are considerably larger than base scallops. And I, I think most of us agree that they're not as tasty as base scallops, you know, but that's another story. <laughs> um, so the, the sea scallops um, have fared considerably better. And, there, and I think there's several reasons for that. One is that their lifespan is much longer. They live for between 15 to 20 years. So if you have, if you have one bad year, Okay, you know, they weather through that and so forth, so as opposed to base scalps, um, where it's basically a one-year animal. Um, they live primarily out on the continental shelf, so they're in deeper water. Um, and, you know, you might think, well, they, they're immune to, to climate change because they're living in such deep water, but, but that's actually not the case. Their climate change is even being felt in the deep, deepest parts of the ocean. Um, so, um, you know, they may not quite be as sensitive to environmental factors as, as base scalps, and, and that perhaps is one reason uh, that they've survived better. But, um, you know, sea scalps have been um, managed very successfully uh, by the federal government for, for a long time now. Um, you know, they have areas that are protected, they have size limits, they have catch limits, and, you know, I think all of that has helped um, to sustain the, the sea scalp fishery. But, uh, I would just say that they're probably not as sensitive to environmental factors as uh, base scallops, and, and I think that's a big reason also why they uh, have fared better. So you don't think that like increased um, protections or something would help at all? Or is that time for, already for passed? Scallops? Yeah. Um, no, I don't think management is really the issue with base scallops. You know, the, 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 the opening of the season now is at the beginning of November. Um, you know, uh, a few decades ago, it was the middle of September, and then it got moved to the beginning of October. But some of the work we did showed that scallops were, were spawning well into the fall, and, and that that fall spawn actually was really important to the populations. Um, so we, we kind of worked to, to push the opening of the season back to November. So that, I, think, I think that's helped. Um, you know, now, now we're in dire circumstances, and. Um, you know, but I, I don't think the management is really the issue with, with base scallops. At least that's positive. Um, so there's been recent, we just had flash floods and there's some emergency shellfish closures all across the Peconic and the North and South Forks. Barley, can you share about, you know, I think that's something that as a consumer you might read about and then you freak out and you think, oh, I can't eat any shellfish. Can you share a bit about like what that means and 
from a business perspective, but also like an environmental one? Yeah, so as we speak, uh, Three Mile Harbor and North Sea Harbor, two of our local main harbors are closed to shell fishing because of the, the heavy rains we just got. So, you know, obviously there's other harbors that one can go shell fishing in, but if, if one has a business in any of those harbors, for instance, there, there is a, a sh small shellfish farm in North Sea Harbor, then they, they either have to see it coming and harvest beforehand and stock up, which is reasonable, or they shut down until things open up again. And that, you know, that closure can last as much as a week. Um, the last storm we got, Three Mile Harbor was actually closed for two weeks. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, like I said, you, can, you might be able to go to other harbors and harvest, but if you have an actual uh, infrastructure in that harbor, then you're shut down. And, um, you know, luckily, you know, these are, these are estuarine animals that we're working with. The bay scallop is obviously the most sensitive, but oysters, clams, they can all they can all manage, make it through this, this fluctuation in salinity. Um, but it's really the, the folks that are relying on, on that harvest. You either got to, like I said, see it coming and stockpile or you're shut down and got to do something else until, until it opens up again. Has it affected your businesses personally? Like I imagine this time of year it's probably easier to manage that. But like in the summer, you know, you, that's a big time for everyone. How have you managed yeah. that? Rainfall doesn't, where I am in the Peconics, the Peconics are rarely shut down due to mm -hmm. rainfall, uh, just because it's such a, such a large body of water. And I, you know, you could say the solution to pollution is dilution. So uh, the rainfalls we've been getting haven't been shutting down the Peconics. My, my biggest worry on my personal farm is harmful algae blooms. Mm -hmm. And we've been seeing, you know, brown tide hasn't really reared its ugly head lately, but every year we're getting rust tides. And rust tide is the one that affects shellfish, but doesn't affect human consumption. So I'm seeing, uh, I haven't seen any mortalities, but I'm seeing definitely slower growth. And that this year, again, another anomaly, uh, usually that rust tide is gone by October, that this year it, it stuck around well into October because the water remained warmer. Um, and so it, it, it just stuck around. And then as soon as we got that first kind of cold snap, it disappeared. But for me and, other, and my other colleagues, the harmful algae is probably more of a worry than, than rainfall. And so is the increase in water temperature the linchpin in this problem, Stephen? Yeah, I, I think it is. Um, as I was saying, I, you know, the disease may have been here uh, for quite some time. We, we don't know. But um, you know, uh, wh why now are we seeing this die off? And, and I believe it's due to the water temperatures. You know, and looking at uh, the, the data uh, for uh, temperature uh, over the last 10 years, um, it's, it's getting warmer almost every year. And, um, you know, um, you, you're getting up to a point now where you're, you're really pushing the red line for scallops. And then when you throw in the disease and, and then, you know, other physiological stressors, um, I, I think that's why we're in a situation where we have now. Again, going back to Nantucket, 100% of the scallops that, that were looked at had the disease. So presumably it's still there, um, and yet there's, there's no die-off occurring like this. And then, you know, the, the most logical explanation is because the waters are cooler, um, and they haven't experienced what, what we're experiencing here. And so like less overall stress on the scallop because yeah. the water right. is cooler. Right. And then what about the, you know, obviously fish and marine an animal species like the cow nose rays, Things are moving further north. How is that affecting scallops? Yeah, so cow nose ray is a um, is a known predator of adult shellfish. Uh, it's primarily a southern species that has um, it has been seen in our waters um, to some extent over the years, um, but in the last three years, it has shown up in much larger numbers. And um, you know, oyster growers are reporting this, uh, especially the trap net fishermen. Uh, they're the ones that, that really see this the most. And um, so we've been trying to get more information about, you know, uh, when did they come here? How long are they here? What are they doing? Uh, are they eating our scops? And um, so that, you know, that's the big question. And um, when we, we, we do population surveys. Uh, we, we do it by scuba diving. We do it in the spring and the fall of every year. Uh, we've done this for 17 years in a row now, and um, 
So, you know, we look at predator levels, we look at uh, the, the shells of dead, dead scallops, what we call cluckers, um, where the hinges are still articulated. And, um, you know, three years ago, we started going to areas and, okay, there's this big die off. All right, so where are the cluckers? In many of the areas, we didn't see any cluckers. I was like, this is weird, you know? <laughs> so, you know, we don't think that all of a sudden, um, you know, the, the, the usual suite of predators, uh, whelks and, you know, fish or what have you, um, are, are the responsible for this die off. So then the cow nose rays started showing up in bigger numbers. We're like, man, I wonder if that's part of this. And we, we think they may be important, but we really don't know for sure. Now this year, uh, we did a very intensive um, monitoring project that was funded by uh, New York State. We worked with um, researchers from Stony Brook uh, and, and our crew at Cornell Crawford Extension. And so we, we sampled scallops every two weeks from May up until last week. We looked at spawning cycles. We looked at disease loads. We looked at environmental factors. And we saw um, probably over 90% die off of the adults by late July this year, somewhere around there. And so most of the die off that occurred happened this year before we got reports of the cow nose rays showing up. So we don't think they were as important this year, but last year and perhaps the year before, they, they were more important, you know. So, um, so that, that's something that we want to get more information on, you know. But again, well, why are the cow nose rays here? Well, the water's warmer, you know, and they're, they're moving north. So there's a lot of movement of animals where it's possible in response to climate change, you know. Black sea bass, which are common around here, are now moving up into Maine waters and they're starting to eat baby lobsters. So, you know, th this is one of the things, just one of the manifestations of climate change. You know, it's apparent to, you know, those of us who work in, in the biological field, you know, we may be more attuned to this, you know, but, you know, your, your flowers are blooming earlier in the spring, you know, and the farmers are uh, experiencing big problems because of climate change. And, so, um, you know, it's all around us. It's all around us, and um, it, it has a big effect on what's going on. Definitely, and you know, trying to think of these new solutions to climate change and adapting, are the parasites that harm the scallops an organism that is food for oysters? And how does the restoration of oyster reefs in the ecosystem, can that help bring back more of a balance? Yeah, I, I, I don't know if, if they're eaten by, by oysters. Um, you know, barley may be able to shed some light on that, but the the uh, the parasite is it's a uh, it's a protozoan parasite, um, and it, um, it it affects the uh, it's several different organs of the bay scallops, and uh, we don't know that much about the life cycle at this point. You know, uh, this year we took sediments uh, samples of of sediment and water in in addition to scallops to see you know is it present in the environment is it uh, does it have a, a reservoir host? In other words, does it have an, another animal that it infects as part of its life cycle? So these are things that we're, we're trying to answer, but we don't really know right now. So, so you know, I don't know that increasing oyster populations would, would really have any effect on, on this. And, um, you know, you might think, okay, well, are they in oysters? You know, is this a potential problem to oysters or clams? And at this point, I, I don't think there's, a, there's any issue there, you know. So. so given all of this news, Barley, do you think we're going to be eating scallops at Thanksgiving or is it going to be like skates in, in yeah. butter uh, in a scallop shell? Probably not eating local scallops. You might be able to get some Nantucket ones for 40 bucks a pound. But yeah. <laughs> no, I think uh, there's really very few, if any. There are some, yeah. some smashed shells. The gulls are finding them. There's some shells on the, yeah. on the parking lot up at Three Mile Harbor. But... Um, but on a, to, to bring in another positive note, one of the, one of the um, old time fishermen that I see occasionally in Napeague said that he's never seen uh, the bait fish like it was this year. You know, he was, yeah. just said, and he's probably around 80 years old, and he said he's never seen uh, the amount of bait fish that he saw this year. And anybody who spent any time on the beach you know, we saw all the whales and the, and the dolphins and all those huge schools of 
Bunker or Menhaden, those numbers are off the charts. So on a positive note, the, the, some, of those, some of those fin fish stocks are really doing great, and it's all because of that low trophic level bunker or Atlantic Menhaden whose populations are taking off. Yeah, no, that is very exciting. I actually did my ocean rescue recertification this summer, and we had to do it in East Hampton, and we had like all these bunker that we were swimming through. And we we're like, we yeah. love this, but we hate this. It's disgusting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, you had to like swim through it and they'd use the jet skis to get them away. Um, anyway, so to kind of bring it back to something that we can all do, because obviously, you know, climate change is such a big issue. Um, what are impacts that homeowners or residents or even people that just spend time out here can do that might have a positive impact on the declining water quality? Yeah, I mean, that's always a, a great question. Um, <laughs> and um, I, I mean, certainly if, if, if you know more about what's going on and, and what are the factors driving some of these uh, issues, problems, um, that, that's, that's always helpful, uh, certainly, you know. Um, you know, I, I think just having a greater awareness of the climate crisis and, and you know, climate change is kind of a, a milquetoast uh, phrase, you know, climate change, okay. Well, it's, it's really a crisis, you know, and, you know, we're, the, the science is irrefutable. Uh, we're, we're at a point now where, you know, I, I know this is all negative stuff, but, but it's, it's, you know, we're at a point now where, you know, we, we've got to deal with this as, as a human species. It, it's global, it's happening everywhere, and it's got to get uh, dealt with. You know, so just becoming aware of this and, um, you know, for people that become educated about is, is where you start, is, is where you start. Um, you know, at a local level, uh, what, what can you do to help? Well, you know, um, j just helping to protect the environment, um, what we have left uh, is, is helpful. You know, when, when you start looking at um, what animals and plants have experienced in, in our, our local bays and waterways, um, you know, all of the stressors compound, you know. So if, if you're adding additional stressors like uh, excess nutrients, you know, from fertilizers on your lawn, uh, runoff, things like this, th those are all things that, that add additional layers of stress to these animals. You know, chemicals that are used to spray on uh, agricultural fields. You know, they, they leach into the water, and those, those are contributing to, to uh, additional levels of, of stressors for these, these organisms. So, you know, reducing that and, um, you know, uh, helping to educate people and getting them to understand that, okay, yeah, there, there's, there are alternatives. You know, the cleaners you use around your house, you know, those get, um, get into the water eventually. And, um, you know, they, they make their way. I mean, you know, we have these, these legacy chemicals and legacy nitrogen from decades of farming that are now working their way into the Peconic Bay system in, in groundwater. And this is from 40 plus years ago, you know. So those things continue to, um, to add to the stressors, you know. So, you know, so, so those are things, you know, just on a local level uh, at your house to reduce the use of toxins and fertilizers and so forth. And actually starting from November 1st to April 15th, there's a Suffolk County moratorium on putting fertilizer on your lawn. So not only is it good for the environment, but it's illegal. Um, <laughs> Barley, do you have some tips for residents to share that how we can positively impact water quality uh, for future generations? Sure. I mean, there's, of course, you know, we had Sean O'Neill here last time who talked all about the innovative alternative septic systems and uh, if you can jump through the hoops to get those installed, they're, they can basically be free. So that's a huge factor. So septics along with nitrogen fertilizers, those are the two main players. So if we can, if we can battle, tackle those. Uh, back to the, the, the uh, one quick aside, I think one of the things we're having to overcome is that whether it was Al Gore or whoever way back in the beginning called it global warming. And that's, that, that's proved to be a problem, right? I mean, wasn't there a, a senator that brought a snowball into the, to, the, to the big house and said, ah, snowing out, the globe isn't warming. So calling it climate change instead of 
warming is a start because it's not all warming. You know, there's we have more there's more water in the atmosphere and it's and it's coming down in different places, causing problems. So it's it's uh, we have to get our greater phraseology down better for, so people can get a better grasp on it and not fixate on this this global warming phrase. Um, and just to, for folks to realize that, you know, let's not see ourselves in an, as an exception, that everybody has a place and, and every, everything that everybody does is going to have an effect. At the same time, you know, there has to be some changes up, up, up at the higher levels. You know, if we, if we turn on a light in our house and the power is derived from something that's harmful to the environment, there's nothing really that we can do about that, aside from install solar panels, which a lot of people are doing, and that's another benefit, but not everybody can afford to install solar panels or, or buy electric cars. So there's a lot that has to be done at the higher level to, to you know, help, help climate change and, and clean up our energy sources. Definitely. And I think, you know, speaking about the bunker, like how many bunker we have and the bait fish and stuff like that, I mean, a lot of that is linked to federal protections and the whales, mm -hmm. like the Federal Protection of the Marine Mammals Act in the 80s. So obviously when, you know, individuals and the government work together, we can see changes. Um, I want to open the, the floor up to the audience. I'll repeat the question so that it, um, it can be heard on air. So just give a pause before you're... Your responses, Susan. Um, on the restoration work that um, the co-op co co is, what did the larvae attach to the field grants and stuff they On the restoration work that Cornell Cooperative Extension has done, what did the lar scallop larvae attach to? if not eelgrass? I'm so glad you asked that question, Susan. Um, yeah, so we've done uh, work on this uh, for, for quite a while. Um, so we were like, okay, what are the scallops doing uh, if they're not attaching eelgrass? And uh, as part of our restoration work, we do larval monitoring where we put out uh, mesh bags, uh, we call them spat bags, and, and scallop larvae will attach them. Scallops will attach to basically almost anything, really. They, they have these tiny little Bissell threads, if you think of a, a blue mussel, you know, that, that the beard, th those are bristle threads. Uh, scallops have those, not as many. But so we went out and we started, we, we just went out diving and said, okay, well, let's start looking at all their substrates and see if there's scallops there. And they were on all different species of uh, seaweeds, macroalgae. So what we found is that um, we, we went around uh, tons of dives around the bay and uh, people with, better eyes than me, we're, we're, we're seeing this. Uh, and so what, what we found is that scops were attached to like 10 different species of, of macroalgae. And um, we, we actually monitored what and, and measured the, the maximum size of scops that were attached to these. And what we found is that um, some of the seaweeds, the scops, you know, the largest ones attached were less than 10 millimeters, you know, maybe three millimeters or seven millimeters. So if you calculate the, uh, the age of those scallops based on the known growth rates, uh, what you find is that they're only attached to those seaweeds for maybe a, a week, okay? Whereas attached, you know, eelgrass can support scallops up to 25 to 30 millimeters. So the scallops are attached above the bottom for two months. And what that translates to is that when scalps make their way to the bottom, they're susceptible to a much larger number of predators than they would be if they're above the bottom. So that's why we say eelgrass is the best substrate, but there are other substrates that they can use, you know. So, um, so that, that's been a very interesting, um, you know, uh, line of, of research that, that we've been looking at. In, uh, so yeah, so they, they do obviously settle on things, but it's, it's not as good as eelgrass as far as we know. Yeah, that's a good question as well. Um, th there, there are trade-offs as to the height that scalps attach to in 
I assume that um, the the larvae eat. Sorry. Yeah. So Plank, the ar larvae eat plankton, and at different there's different levels of plankton in the water. So how does that affect all of this? Yeah. Um, in, in terms of larvae, um, you know, larval scallops are feeding on uh, single-celled algae while they're in the water column. Uh, they have a little bit of nutritional store of themselves, but not that much. But, um, but I, I think that the most important part of this is is when they settle to the bottom. You know, what are they feeding on there, right? So um, there are uh, trade-offs with regard to the height that scallops attach above the bottom. So you know, if you're higher above the bottom, you're uh, safer from more predators, but you may actually get more food, uh, a little bit more food at, at a slightly lower level. So, it, so there are some trade-offs involved with that. Yeah. You said something surprising to me. Um, I thought that the die-offs and the runoffs and closures were due to pollution and um, not the salinity of the water. Can you share a little bit about that? Uh, no, I, m I must have misspoke. The, the closures are due to the excessive rainfall and the introduction of pollutants. So that's why we. That's why the waters are closed. But I think one of the other things that I should have spoken to was. We get a lot of questions of, well, there's, you know, there's so many areas that are closed to shellfishing. How can I trust that these shellfish that I'm eating are safe? And there's a lot of testing, and there's 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 maps that are available that that show which harbors and which sections of which harbors are open to shellfishing, and it's taken very seriously and it's tested very often. It's it's actually probably it's it's very conservative um, in order to keep people safe. So. Just rest assured that a farmer is in certified waters, our oyster gardens are in certified waters, and trust that anyone who is harvesting shellfish is harvesting them from certified waters. So the reason that Three Mile Harbor is closed right now is because of the excess of rain and an introduction of E. coli into the water, and that's, it's, that's why it's shut for a certain period. Thanks for the clarification. And if you ever want to know about which waters are um, closed or not, it's very accessible on like DEC website. And also the town has links and everything. Yes. Do you find that Sputnik grass is being affected due to warmer climates as the reverse is being affected? Are you noticing that Sputnik grass is dying off like eel grass habitats are? Um, is Sputnik grass being affected the same way as eel grass in regards to climate change? I haven't noticed a decrease. Um, it seems to be pretty stable. I haven't noticed a, either an increase or a decrease in the areas that we work, but that's a good question. Yeah, I, I've heard some, some uh, fishermen say that it's declining in some areas, and then I've heard some fishermen say in other areas it's increasing. So, hmm. yeah, I, I, I can't answer that uh, directly. Yeah, it's, uh, codium is actually a, a really good substitute substrate for uh, for scallop attachment um, probably next to eelgrass that that's the best one out there yeah. so it, it's an important uh, part of the ecosystem yeah what about sugar kelp can't we get them together <laughs> what about sugar kelp can't we get them together well i uh, sugar kelp is uh, you know uh, a very promising crop um, I, I think uh, for the most part in, in natural scallop populations that they don't overlap in habitat very much with kelp. Kelp are typically found in, um, you know, rockier areas, um, you know, high, high flow, and, and that's not where you find most of the bay scallops. No, you, no. You spoke about the uh, parasites being in 100% of all scallops. Um, what about in us? Would they be in us if we were tested? 
yeah, th this is not harmful to humans. Uh, it's not harmful to humans. But um, I, I did want to, I hope that answered your question, but um, I did want to just say a little <laughs> bit more about the, the parasite, you know. So we've been talking doom and gloom up here for most of the night. And uh, so one thing I just wanted to touch on is, you know, what, what can we do to, uh, to help the scops at this point? So um, we, we, we are now undertaking a couple of projects to do uh, selective breeding of base scops for higher resistance to the parasite as well as to higher water temperature. Uh, Dr. Alam at Stony Brook is leading these in. So the idea is that um, we can basically take animals that have survived exposure uh, to these, these stressors in, either in the laboratory or from the field and then use those as, as parent stock, as brood stock to produce offspring that are, are more tolerant of that. I mean, you know, we expect that this is, is happening in the natural environment to some extent, and it may be already to some, to some level. Um, you know, this year uh, in our surveys, we've, we've seen a few more adult scalps than last year. Last year was basically zero across the board. Um, and, and I'm not saying it's going to be a great year, but, you know, Mother Nature's not standing still either here. So, but what we can do to help move the process along is to, to try to um, breed more resistant scallops. And um, I really think that that's, that's our best hope going forward. And it's worked very well for oysters. It's worked very well for clams. So there's no reason it couldn't work for, for our base scallops. We have time for a very short question. Is yours short? <laughs> okay. So given the kind of environmental degradation of all these different species of oysters, scallops, eelgrass, is there a way that we can kind of have them all together, work together to fight these changes? Yeah, ideally when you have a, a, a strong ecosystem, then, then things are, are better across the board for, for any number of different species. And, and that, that's a very noble objective. But I think we're at a point right now with, with temperatures being so warm that eelgrass recovery I, I don't really think is is that feasible right now at least with the strains of, of eelgrass that that you know we're, we're looking at you know um, yeah I, I, I think in in some regards it, it may be easier to restore uh, pieces you know oysters you know I, I'm not saying we might get back to oyster reefs like we had hundreds of years ago you know but uh, helping to restore those populations. So, but thank um, you, Stephen. Just okay. we're about to end our program with a wonderful question. Thank you to South Fork Sea Farmers. Thank you to Channing Daughters Winery, Promised Land Mariculture Company. Have a good day. <laughs>